Andy Cohen, Vice President of Research in Americans for the Arts, and welcome to the 10 Reasons to Support the Arts in 2024 webinar. So glad you're here. So glad you're watching. Um, 10 Reasons to Support the Arts. Uh, that's our handy one pager that we do every year. There are so many reasons to support the arts, but um, you know, it's great to just to have 10 really good ones right there on one page. Uh, and that's what um, we're going to talk about today. And so uh, we're not going to talk about all the wonderful reasons of the arts. Um, more webinars to come about that. So um, I am going to uh, start by sharing my screen here. And um, here we are, 10 reasons to support the arts. Uh, and um, that's what the one pager looks like. Uh, and you can actually download that. We'll put in a link and so you can click on this. Um, but as you can see, it's just 10 reasons, one side of a page. Um, and one thing I do wanna highlight is um, you'll see the headers are, uh, bolded in each of those. And when you look at this electronically on your computer, if you click on those, it'll take you to more information about the topic. Uh, and so we've really kind of scaled the information. So you get a couple great sentences here and, you know, but you might want to know more and there's a way to do that. Um, and, you know, our goal really in Americans for the Arts just to make everyone great advocates and champions for the arts. So we need a quiver full of case making arrows uh, for the arts. And that's that's largely what today is about. Now I say it's 10 reasons to support the arts. Actually, I sneak an 11th reason uh, up there at the top. Uh, and that is, um, it's a reminder that the arts are part of our humanity. Uh, it's part of our human nature uh, to create. Um, and I give you as evidence of that, um, this, hand carved flute, which was found in a cave a few years back by some anthropologists who were studying cave dwelling situ uh, civilizations in Europe. And uh, uh, they thought, boy, wouldn't it be great if we found a bowl or a spoon or hit the jackpot with some cave paintings, perhaps. Well, they found this hand carved flute, which um, they carbon dated to be 35,000 years old. It's made out of animal bone. See, it's a beautiful piece of work all on its own. Eventually somebody got, you know, the guy enough guts that, well, I guess we should blow some air through it and see what happens. Here, you do it. Uh, and it had some good tonality too. Now, what was interesting is this was a big find uh, in the science world. And, and it was actually published in the journal Nature, which is one of the top scientific journals in the world. These anthropologists in this article were trying to figure out what was the purpose of this flute? Hmm, I thought, well, maybe it was a way to help promote territorial expansion or a way to celebrate the hunt or maybe related to the fertility ritual. I kept thinking maybe they liked the way it sounded. That never showed up. Uh, but, uh, you know, the idea, arts and creativity and it's been part of our humanity um, for many, many millennia. Now, interestingly, this flute thing really stayed with folks. Um, fast forward 35,000 years uh, to um, the 1500s where we find the shame flute. Um, now, once again, people still caring about their music, uh, but a little differently. This little um, ditty was made out of cast iron. You can see on the right there. And that round part was clasped around a person's neck and the fingers were shackled to that iron tube. Uh, and the purpose of the shame flute was to punish bad musicians. That's right. You got a gig at the Prince's Palace and you stank up the joint. Well, they'd march around town for a couple of days in the shame flute. Uh, I used to be able to see this in Washington, D.C. at the uh, Museum of Crime and Punishment. Um, where else would that museum be? Uh, but you can see actually on the left, there's a painting of it. Um, and, you know, we're going to talk about cultural tourism. Uh, nothing brings out a crowd like the shame flute. All right. So, um, Arts central to our humanity have been for a long time. Um, a couple of the data points that I'll talk today come from um, Americans speak out about the arts in 2023. Every couple of years, Americans for the Arts does one of the largest public opinion surveys uh, of the arts um, 
ever. They're the largest ones that are out there. We look at personal participation. We look at opinions on public funding for the arts, public support for arts education, and how people feel about what the arts do for them personally and how those benefits extend to the community. And two of my favorite numbers, uh, which sort of is a nice transition here, 86% of the American population says arts are important to communities' livability and quality of life. So, you know, just about nine in 10 people, and, and that's not really a surprise. What's interesting is 79% um, also uh, agree that arts and culture, good for local businesses, good for local jobs, good for the local economy. And most of today's presentation is going to be about some very pragmatic ways to talk about the arts, to help convince people uh, about the importance of um, arts funding and favorable arts policies. Um, and so this is, this is the perfect uh, data transition here. Um, People appreciate both of these things in their lives. So um, one of the new uh, pieces of research, uh, since we did the last year's 10 Reasons to Support the Arts, um, we published Arts and Economic Prosperity 6, a economic and social impact study of nonprofit arts and culture organizations and their audiences. And by number six, you can see we've done this before. Um, this was our largest study uh, ever. We've been doing these for 30 uh, years. We had 373 communities across all 50 states and Puerto Rico. And it's one more way to talk about the arts that's not really an intuitive way uh, to think about the arts for a lot of people. But the fact is, arts organizations are businesses, and they employ people locally. And that's a story that we have to be able to tell. Um, what we found in Arts and Economic Prosperity 6, and you'll see a website where you can learn a lot more about this, um, arts and culture, nonprofit arts and culture in this country is a $151.7 billion industry. That is billion with a B. Much bigger industry than most people expect. Now that figure is actually composed of two numbers. First, spending by nonprofit arts and culture organizations themselves. And you can see there on the left, $73.3 billion. Arts organizations are businesses. We employ people locally. We purchase goods and services from other businesses in the community. Um, we're members of the Chamber of Commerce. Arts organizations are good business citizens. And that's something we live through all the time, but it's not an intuitive way for a lot of people to think about the arts. Um, and um, they generate a lot of event-related spending. You know, think of the cultural tourism and how every time we go out to an arts event, um, we pay for parking and have dinner and go out for dessert after the show. You got little ones at home. That will cost the evening on babysitting. Lots of economic activity related to that arts event. We generate a lot of commerce for local businesses. So you tally that all up nationally, $78.4 billion. So that's how we get $151.7 billion industry. What's the economic impact of that? Well, the first thing we look at is jobs, 2.6 million jobs supported uh, as a result of that economic activity. And why is that important? Ask any elected leader their three priorities, and there's a good chance they'll tell you, jobs, jobs, and jobs. So we're connecting our arts and culture product to their jobs, uh, uh, interest in jobs. Now, a little something about arts jobs. Um, Arts organizations support a whole range of industries in the community. You know, and we may think of it, you know, when we go to a museum and we see a curator at work or we go to a performance and, you know, wow, those musicians or performers on the stage are being paid. But the fact is, arts organizations also um, have security staff and plumbers and accountants and auditors and box office and marketing people. If you've got an arts facility, you know, um, you may pay a huge utility bill to keep that place cool uh, in the summer and warm in the winter. So um, 
the arts organizations support a whole range of jobs in the community, not just artists. And then also remember, there's the hospitality jobs, right? When you go out to a restaurant, included in there might be the waiter and the owner of the restaurant, the person who runs the parking garage. So arts uh, jobs and the bottom line here, arts, not just food for the soul, but putting food on the table for 2.6 million households in the United States. What else do our elected leaders care a lot about? Government revenue. If you tally up all the federal, state, and local government revenue as a result of that economic activity, $29.1 billion. That's the arts. Small investments, big returns. Pretty much anywhere you go, you look at the amount of that investment uh, in the arts, and it's coming back in even larger amounts in terms of government revenue. And that just reminds us that the arts, when we fund the arts, those dollars aren't going down some black hole of goodness, given back to the community, government revenue, jobs, all that, of course, in addition to quality of life. Now, no surprise, um, arts organizations have an economic impact. Um, every business has an economic impact. Anytime a dollar changes hands, there's an economic impact. But few industries generate the kind of event-related spending that the arts do. Nationally, as part of this study, we did 224,000 audience intercept surveys. A ridiculous oversample, right? And we found the typical attendee to an arts and culture event spends $38.46 per person per event, not including the cost of admission. And you can see, um, you know, how those numbers break out. And, you know, the 373 communities, I mean, everyone's mileage differs, you know, some are more, some are less. Uh, and I'll give you a link so you can see all those communities data. But typically, you know, I, on the left there, about half is uh, on food and drink. And um, so you might be looking at lodging. Wow, where can you get a room for $5.02? Um, and would you want it if you could get it? No, you wouldn't. Um, not everyone's got a lodging cost. You know, these are averages. I'll tell you, other is always fascinating. Um, one of my favorite other expenditures, um, there was a farmer in Wisconsin who paid somebody $60 to milk his cows so he could go to the theater that night. Isn't that great? People are doing what it takes to get to the arts. So lots of economic activity. Now, we also asked those folks for their zip code because we want to find out, do they live in the county in which the arts events taking place? Which would make them local. Are they from outside the county? 30% um, of attendees came from outside the county. And do they spend differently? Yeah, you bet they do. Look at that on the right, $60.57 per person per event, not including the cost of admission. We asked those folks one more question. We asked the non-local ones, um, why are you here? <laughs> you know, thank you for coming. We're glad you're here. Are you here on business, you're here visiting friends and family? You know, two very common reasons for traveling. 77% of attendees said, we came specifically for this arts event. So you can really see the pulling power of the arts. So when we invest in the arts, it's not a frill or an extra, it's an industry that's drawing people to their community. And so this is a great economic development and a great cultural tourism story. One of the things we did differently in this study is um, we also asked folks, uh, a little bit more about what this arts event means to them. I mean, you know, the fact is, if I'm deciding what to do this weekend, uh, I'm not going to look down the list and say, well, which one has the best economic impact? Probably a little closer to these questions. And um, more than four in five people nationally and pretty much in communities across the country said um, this arts and culture event that they're attending, it's a pillar for them within the community. 86%. Um, I'd feel a sense of loss if this arts and event were no longer uh, available. Conversely, 88.5%, this arts event is, as, provides a sense of pride and community identity. Uh, and one of the things I think is just most interesting, you know, was the last one, 85.7%. It's important to me that this be available for future generations, this arts event, this venue. And that says to me that, you know, the arts aren't some kind of one-time transactional activity. You know, we do it and we forget about it. Really, it's 
part of our story, our history, our heritage. But it's about where our community's been, where we are, and where we're going. So um, lots of great data to read on that. Now, um, you might be thinking, oh, man, I wish I was one of those 373 communities that participated in this study. Um, and that's the best way to have your own economic impact data. But we also have the Arts and Economic Prosperity Calculator. Uh, and this is a way for you to estimate your organization's economic impact. So go to the website there on the lower left and up at the top, click a button that says calculator. All you need are two numbers, your total expenditures and a total attendance figure. And you pick a community size and you hit populate and your economic impact figures will pop up. It's so easy. It's so easy. I picked this calculator, which somebody told me recently doesn't even have a clear button on it. So uh, um, that's how simple it is. You won't even need a clear button. Um, and then also you'll find on this website, uh, talk about the study, how to increase awareness about it, um, communication strategies, and all kinds of tools to really help you make it a turnkey product. So a uh, really great research study. We're very excited about it. Um, so uh, moving on, um, I want to just quickly talk about another study that's updated every year uh, that you have state data about as well. And so why Arts and Economic Prosperity 6 focused on nonprofit sector in the audience is the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis, top economic shop on the planet, they study the arts every year as well, but they widen the lens to include everything. So yeah, nonprofit organizations, but also um, Hollywood motion pictures, commercial galleries, university drama department, artists, import, export. Um, in 2022, they estimate uh, the arts and culture in this country to be a $1.1 trillion industry. That is trillion with a T. E. Um, huge. That is 4.3% of the nation's economy. Um, that's a bigger share of GDP than construction, transportation, education, agriculture. Trust me, they've all got giant agencies here in Washington, D.C. And here's the arts with even more economic activity um, with that incredible impact. Um, that economic uh, $1.1 trillion supports 5.2 million jobs. So it's, it's a huge industry. Um, now you can get these data at the state level as well. And so I'll just point you to the bottom. Um, the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies uh, has a fabulous site. You go to their website and on the left, you'll see uh, creative economy profiles. When you go to their homepage, click it and it'll take you to a page that looks like this map. And you click on your study and you'll be able to get your statewide data as well. Now that's as granular um, uh, as it gets at the state level. But again, this is really, really powerful uh, research that comes out of the Department of Commerce. Um, uh, a couple interesting things that they've found uh, in analyzing these data over the years, there is a causal relationship between a growth in arts jobs and a growth in all jobs in a state and region. So when somebody says we can't afford the arts because we got to focus on jobs, you know what? Um, you've got uh, something to counter with uh, uh, this important jobs data. Another interesting thing, the US Department of Agriculture has actually gotten into this whole uh, arts and the economy uh, research as well. In rural counties with four or more performing arts organizations, they see a higher number of creative economy businesses uh, based on copyrights and, uh, and such. So uh, even in small rural uh, economies, you can see uh, the economic benefits. Now, these numbers are impressive, but the fact that they even do this research is also impressive. Um, this is called a satellite account. While BEA studies hundreds and hundreds of industries, they only do a couple dozen of these satellite accounts. It's gotta be of some kind of strategic importance um, to the nation, to the economy. And we live in a global innovation economy. And this is an understanding that creativity drives innovation, arts and culture drives creativity. And back to our public opinion study, um, we're seeing the American workers increasingly say that creativity is a part of their job. 55% uh, of employed um, 
uh, American adults say their job uh, requires them to be creative, either individually or as a group. 60% say the more creative they are uh, at their job, the more successful uh, they are at their job. Um, so we're seeing that pop up in a lot of ways. And that leads us um, again, and in, in just if you get back to your 10 reasons sheet, I'm just sort of working my way down jumping around just a little bit, but the, everything I'm talking about is on there. Um, and this is a report from uh, our wonderful partners at the Conference Board. Conference Board, that's the National Organization for Big Business in this country. Their research shows um, that creativity is now among the top five applied skills that business leaders are looking for. In fact, it's leapfrog the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. Well, of course you have to be able to read, write, and do math. But if you could take some creativity and apply it to your scientific, your engineering, your coding knowledge, those are the competitive jobs, the high paying jobs we're all trying uh, to attract uh, to our communities. It's making us competitive in this global economy. 72% of business leaders say creativity is of high importance in hiring. 85% of those folks say, can't find the people we're looking for. You know, there's no typing test for creativity, right? So um, how do you know if you got a creative worker across the table from you? Well, there were two reasons way at the top when they um, these business scholars uh, interrogated this question. One was starting your own business, so entrepreneurial activity, and two, um, study of the arts especially while in college. And they write in the conclusion of this report, again, business scholars writing for business leaders, it's clear that the arts, music, drama, drawing, dance, media, literature, provide skills sought by employers of the third millennium. So really powerful, powerful findings. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and again, that's coming out of the business community. And so we're, we're just reporting the good news here, right? Uh, and of course, that makes uh, an important case for arts education. Um, and I think, honestly, there's just nothing more important uh, that we can be doing to make sure um, every student in this country is getting a quality arts education. The, the data is just too powerful uh, to ignore the benefits of this. Um, and I just got to tell you, um, for me, <laughs> you know, when I was a student, Whatever was going on outside that window, that was the most interesting thing going on for me that day. Um, and I can just say personally, it was the arts. It was theater and drama that kept me interested in school and, and coming back. And so um, really, really uh, engaging for our students. But there's again, there's also research that demonstrates the academic benefits. Um, James Catterall was a UCLA researcher. Um, and who studied arts education for a long time. And um, one of the studies he did used data from uh, Department of Education data from 25,000 students in 1,000 schools across the country. So a huge representative national data set. And um, what he did is he looked at those 25,000 students and he divided them into four quartiles based on their level of arts involvement. So up here in this could be in school or out of school, um, you know, practices the violin three hours a day and, you know, and gets to arts and culture events and then compared them to um, the quartile that was the least involved. You know, I maybe got to the museum once last year or something. And the first thing he looked at was academic performance. And what he found, the arts involved students better grades, better standardized test scores, lower dropout rates, right? <laughs> Aren't we looking for ways to you know, keep our kids in school? Even better attitudes about community service. Now, because I know you're all good consumers of research, because here you are. Um, you're probably asking yourself, well, yeah, but, you know, aren't those more arts involved students, maybe from better educated or more affluent families? And wouldn't you be expecting them to do, you know, better on all these academic measures? So Dr. Catterall went back to his base of a thousand students because he asked himself the same question. And he looked at the lowest socioeconomic quartile. So just the students who attend Title I schools, the students who live in low-income communities. And he did the same analysis. And what he found, not only did the results hold, 
there was an even greater disparity between the arts involved and the least arts involved students. Helping education researchers think, wow, you know, maybe the arts help level the playing field or students who got a late start to catch up. Um, so now just put that right here for a second because um, there's other research that the US Department of Education has done, uh, you know, every 10 or so years, they look at the national provision of arts education and nationally it's held kind of steady where we see a lot of variation is in communities or at the state level, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. What they found, however, was students attending Title I schools and uh, living in low income communities saw a huge drop off in arts education. So the students who stood over here to gain the most out of it were in fact the ones losing it the fastest. And Obama's secretary of education called this a civil rights issue because the research is so clear about the arts, keeping kids in school, getting a good education. And even, you know, in Dr. Catterall's work looked um, at a cohort even in their 20s and that even as young adults, you can see more college going, more likely to be in career oriented jobs. And so, Really, really powerful, um, uh, powerful research findings. Um, the uh, uh, the public opinion study we just talked about, ninety two percent of the American public says it's important um, for students to get an education uh, in the arts. And yet, when asked, do students in your community have enough opportunity uh, for arts learning and arts classes? Just fifty two percent said yes. So um, I think we, you know, we have an access uh, issue and um, uh, respondents in rural communities um, uh, said um, even fewer of them responded yes. So uh, lots of important work to do there with arts education. And um, this is a story I love, uh, it, you know, um, this is what it looks like in action. So this happy looking fella, Thomas Sudoff, a um, few years back got the Nobel Prize in medicine um, and he's a Stanford researcher. Uh, the, uh, and then he was talking to the press and the media and one of the reporters asked him and said, you know, professor, who was your most influential teacher growing up? And I'm sure they all expect him to say, oh, I'll never forget my high school biology teacher. Actually, no, without missing a beat, he said, I owe it all to my bassoon teacher. And he went on to describe how it was his music education that gave him the habits of mind that made him a great scientist. Pattern recognition, ability to deal with ambiguity, um, problem identification, problem solving, perseverance and stick to itiveness, you know, looking for creative solutions, right? That's what arts education does. Um, and I also always like to remind folks that, you know, the purpose of arts education isn't just to create the next generation of artists. That'll happen. It's really just how do we create better citizens, more engaged people, more empathetic uh, people in, in our community? Um, I heard someone saying recently that um, in the United States right now, we live in a, a crisis of certainty. I never heard that before, a crisis of certainty. Um, people get so entrenched in their positions now. And what we need really are ways to help understanding and empathy and listening. Um, and that's something that the arts do. So, uh, and you can see that in the data as well. So um, back to the public opinion study, 72% uh, of the American public says um, the, uh, the arts uh, uh, create opportunities for shared experiences with people of different uh, race, ethnicity, um, faith, age, right? It's an opportunity for all of us to have shared events together. 63% uh, say the arts um, help unify communities and help understand other cultures uh, in their communities. Um, so some really powerful numbers there. Um, that I, I like to tout. Uh, and then, um, so back to now, back to the list. Um, and one of my favorite issues also is um, arts and health, uh, health care and emotional care and mental health. Um, so I have an arts background, the theater background. 
duh, right? You know, probably figured that out. But I actually also have a medical research background. Uh, I worked at Stanford University. I worked at Scripps Clinic and Research Foundation in, in La Jolla, California. Um, when I worked at Scripps, um, every Tuesday at three o'clock, we used to have live chamber music in the lobby. And it was amazing how four musicians could just completely transform kind of an already beautiful space. And patients could walk in, they could be wheeled in, they could bring the family along. Medical staff uh, was allowed to participate. What we started to notice is that patients that we'd see in their rooms clinically, lethargic, depressed, even if you had a view of the ocean there and everyone at Scripps did, um, you could see the physical transformation in people in the presence of the music. Their eyes got less cloudy, their posture got better. You could just sense a greater awareness of the environment around them. And we could all see it, you know, it's like, you know, they're getting an IV drip of the arts, something's happening here. Um, and now there's this growing body of research that shows when the arts are part of our healing or part of our hospital experience, and, and the research shows uh, at least half the nation's hospitals have some kind of arts programs, bedside card, rotating exhibits, performances. Um, but for patients, less depression, less medication, fewer doctor visits, um, even evidence that it saves money. Um, and you know, and again, people pay attention to things economically. Healthcare is rapidly working its way towards 20% of our nation's economy. And yet here's a strategy that, you know, enables us to take less medicine, uh, to feel better, to heal faster. Uh, unless we think also, um, oh, this is a whole new idea. Uh, it's always good to remember that the god Apollo was the god of both music and healing. Talk about a big portfolio, that guy had it, right? But, um, you know, a lot of this is we're just rediscovering what we've known 35,000 years ago, several thousand years ago, uh, about the importance and how the arts really just touch all parts of our community. Um, there's so many other ways that the arts uh, touch our communities uh, and ourselves and our own personal well being. Um, Oh, and I, I did actually want to talk about mental health as well. And on this um, uh, Arts Impact Explorer, I call it the pinwheel, and you can see the website there. Go to it. You can click on any of these um, 29 categories. We're always adding to it. it. Spins around. It's just, it's like issue surfing, you know, it's just so much fun. Um, one of the topic areas uh, that you'll find is mental health uh, as well. And um, during the pandemic, we were part of a big international study with University of College London, University of Florida, really one of the arts and healthcare research powerhouses out there. Um, and we did surveys, weekly surveys uh, on tens of thousands of people who responded to these weekly prompts about what their activities were, how they were feeling. Um, one of the things we found uh, is that um, people who had a half hour a day of arts, culture, some kind of creative expressive activity, whether it's uh, making art, watching it, it could be culinary, it could be gardening, creative expressive activity, um, lower rates of depression, lower rates of anxiety, higher rates of life satisfaction. Uh, and so some really powerful findings there. Um, there's other research, just 45 minutes of art making can lower your cortisol levels and reduce stress. Um, Back to the public opinion study where we asked, you know, the American public what, you know, what it's done for them. 60% say arts help them cope during times of mental or emotional distress. Uh, and 69% say, you know what, the arts lift me up beyond everyday experiences. So what we're seeing is the arts provide these personal well-being benefits, and those benefits extend to the community. So, um, let me start to wrap up here real quick uh, with this picture. Uh, from Paris in 1911, bad news at the Louvre, um, the Mona Lisa was stolen, uh, and this is where it was hanging. It took them two years to get it back. But in the two years that the Mona Lisa was missing, more people went to see where it had been hanging than saw the painting itself in the previous 14 years. 
it's so easy to take arts and culture for granted um, for, you know, our community leaders uh, and decision makers and funders to think, sure, our artists, our arts organizations will always be there. But we got a job to do, folks. Um, and just real quick, quickly, we talked about a lot of case making for the arts today. What do we do with that? Well, how do we advocate? And so um, just a couple of quick pointers, you know, and obviously you can go to our website, you can find all kinds of tools and how to, you know, arts at, and how to find your uh, uh, legislators and on down the line to deliver those messages. But um, I break it down to three simple questions. What's the message? Who gets the message? And who delivers the message? What's the message? We just talked about a whole bunch of them, right? Arts good for the economy, support jobs, improve well-being, you know, build healthier communities, uh, improve our 21st century workforce, help students um, uh, uh, flourish in, in school. So we got lots of messages. Second question, that's where you, this is where we have to do a little bit of research. Um, who gets the message? And that's where we've like, who are those decision makers in our environment? You know, is it a city council uh, or a committee or trustees of a foundation? Who are those people and what do they care about? And you know what? Everyone's on their website. It's, you know, they'll say like, well, here's, they'll be talking about something. Um, lead with that. Go to your quiver of case making arrows. Start with that, you know, be ready to talk about all those benefits. So that's who gets the message. And then the third one, who delivers the message? I think that's one of the most important ones someday. You know, when they bring me up to Capitol Hill, they see me coming a mile away, right? You know, guys cover up their wallets, ladies lock their purse in a drawer. I mean, they know what I'm after. But if we can bring a military officer, an artist, a student, parents, school superintendent, hospital CEO, talk about how the arts improve their community, their environment, boy, that makes... Uh, a visit people don't forget. Um, I'll tell you, there's a, a, a few years back, um, we had the mayor of Mesa, Arizona on a panel uh, once about advocacy. And he was telling us a story of how it was budget hearing for the arts uh, that night. It was the mayor and the city council lined up, 60 people there to deliver their three minutes of support for arts education. But he said, I noticed that the chief of police was there that night, which wasn't that unusual for a city council meeting. However, he was in full chief of police regalia, hat, tie, medals, but that was a little different. After everyone else had done their three minutes, the chief of police asked for three minutes and said, you know, if you got to take a cut out of the arts budget, I'd rather you just took it out of my public safety budget, because when they do their job well, it makes my job easier. Imagine if we had a thousand police chiefs on that message, right? So who delivers the message? And then lastly, Always remember the golden rule of advocacy. No stories without a number, no numbers without a story. Stories capture our imagination, attention. They get us uh, emotionally involved. And the numbers, they just bring it home, you know. Uh, so always remember the golden rule. I just want to thank all of you for the incredible work you've done, um, for persisting through the pandemic and continuing to make arts and culture an important part of your community. Um, everything you do to advance the arts is important. You're important for doing it. Thanks very much.